Well, good morning and welcome to Westminster Presbyterian Church's online service. I am so grateful that you are joining us this morning and excited about the opportunity to worship together this morning. What a week it has been for me, and I'm sure it's been quite a week for you as well. With all of the challenges taking place in our city, our schools, the nation, tensions that seem to continue to build, unknowns that we thought were starting to be known are becoming unknown again. What a week. But this is why we come together to worship. We remember that worship is the response to all that God has already done in this world and our proclamation of the confidence we have in God that he isn't done yet either. So let's direct our hearts towards the Lord as we join together in this morning's worship.
Well, if you are wondering about what is happening each and every week here at WPC, I encourage you to sign up for our weekly email. It's the best way to get information about all of our upcoming events. You can sign up by going to our website. Also on our website is an opportunity to continue or start giving to the church. I believe this is one of the most important times to be giving to the church because we are reaching more people than ever through our online services. We're helping people through our mission partners, groups that are on the front lines of ministry in many places, and we have increased other ways that we are serving and helping others as well. So I hope you will continue to give. Now I have one last announcement that I want to make this morning, which for some of you might come as a relief and others it will be disappointing to. You may remember that about a month ago we had decided to begin an outdoor service at the end of July. However, due to the spike of COVID in California, we are modifying our plans and will not be having this outdoor service in July. We still feel so strongly that we need to care for one another and put others ahead of ourselves. Again, I know this may be very disappointing news to some of you. We know that the church is not closed. And like I mentioned, we are still doing so much for people in and out of our congregation. Plus, I want you to know that we are currently putting some plans together for smaller groups to get together, some for fun, for prayer, for some time outdoors maybe. And it's all because we know the need and desire to be together. I would ask that you continue to pray for us and with us as a church, that we would be the light of Christ and shine brightly in our lives so that others may see the light of Christ and draw in. But please be patient with us during this time. Please make sure that as we continue to figure out the best time to work together and to set up our services at the church, that you would be patient and participating and helping us move forward in the kingdom. But now let's continue our service. Good morning, everyone. I know things continue to feel uncertain around us and it can seem like the ground is shifting beneath our feet, but we have a firm place to stand with God and we get to worship him this morning. I want to start our prayer time this morning with some verses from Psalm 18 that David wrote after God had faithfully delivered him from being hunted and killed by Saul when Saul was after him. Uh, so please join me in a time of prayer. Lord, we quiet our hearts before you today. We put aside our other thoughts and concerns and focus in on you. And with the psalmist, we say, I love you, Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock, my fortress and my deliverer. My God is my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I called to the Lord who is worthy of praise, and I have been saved from my enemies. We do praise you, Lord, as our strength, rock, fortress, deliverer. We acknowledge and pledge to love you first, acknowledging that all life and all strength comes from you. Lord Jesus, you have delivered us from our true enemies, from sin and death and the devil. You bring us into safety, and you alone are worthy of our praise. And we turn to you, God, as our defender and stronghold. We know that we cannot earn your favor. We humbly confess our need for you, Jesus. Forgive us our blindness in seeing other people as our enemies. Forgive us for thinking that we know what is best instead of humbly following your way of love. Forgive us, Jesus, for our attempts to save ourselves or elevate ourselves over others. Search our hearts now, Lord, and hear our silent confessions. And 
we do thank you, Lord Jesus, for being our salvation and our shield for forgiveness in your holy name. God, our mighty rock and fortress, we, we pray for your strength and power to help our world. We pray for your light to shatter darkness. And we pray that more people would take refuge in your grace, Lord Jesus. And we pray for the voiceless. God, you see all injustice and all suffering. And we cry out with those who suffer and ask for you to intervene, Lord. Would you be a shield for those who are oppressed and suffering? And would you shine your light to show us your way, Lord? We ask, Lord, for healing that can only come from you. Healing across racial and political divides in our country. And we pray for your church around the world, Lord Jesus. Unite us in our love for you by your Holy Spirit. May we elevate one another and outdo one another in doing good and showing compassion. Bind us together in your name, Jesus. And we pray for our local church as we stand on the rock of salvation in the name of Jesus. Give us wisdom to navigate well in these times. Show us how we can continue to be connected to you and one another and serve you, Lord, here and now. And we pray for others on our hearts today who are wounded in spirit. God, would you be their fortress and refuge? Protect and bolster them. Bring them your comfort. And we pray for those wounded in body. Lord, you are the great physician. We ask that you would be their stronghold. We know that all things are possible with you. And so we pray, according to your will, Jesus, bring your renewing power to fight diseases Bring wholeness in your perfect timing. And we join together to pray as you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Well, last week, you may remember at the end of the series, The Essential Do Nots of Jesus, I mentioned that we would be engaging in the conversation of racial tensions, injustice, and all of the tension that is happening here in our culture and our country. But what a week it has been. And the people and friends that I was going to bring in and interview as part of that uh, conversation, it was amazing. One of them had some type of health issue. Another one was afraid that they had come into contact with COVID. And so we had to put a pause on those conversations. So today, instead, what we are doing is starting a new sermon series. But I want you to know, we will be engaging with those conversations, just not today. Once our friends get better and healthy and have self-isolated so that they are sure they do not have COVID, I will be sitting down with some people and engaging in these interviews to talk about how we as Christians, as followers of Jesus, should engage our current culture. So today I wanted to talk briefly about how remarkable the church is. And I feel so blessed to be able to get up each and every day, each and every week, and work with an incredible staff, volunteers, elders, and deacons, and everyone who is part of the church, including you. The church is remarkable, and not just our church. Well, none of it is really our church, it's God's church. And God's church is remarkable. In fact, how the church came into being is almost inconceivable. To modern friends and foes of the gospel of the church, of Christianity, the church, it seems, almost impossible to have come together the way it did. And yet, it is exactly the way that Jesus predicted. I wanted to tell you about one of my favorite biblical prophecies. And it's not in the Old Testament, but it is this amazing prophecy that Jesus makes. One day, while Jesus was in Caesarea Philippi with his followers, he stops and he says, Okay, let me tell you what is going to happen. I'm going to establish a brand new movement. I'm going to establish a brand new congregation. I will build my ecclesia. And he says, In the gates of hell, the gates of Hades, death itself will not overcome it. Peter Not your death, John, not your death, not even my death will stop it. And friends, it didn't. And it won't. Because the church was a really big idea. Because the church wasn't even our idea. It was our Savior's idea. And the fact that the church got started at all, the fact that it survived the temple and the empire of Rome, there is no good explanation for why it continued, except for the explanation we find that was written by Luke in the book of Acts. But first, I want to share with you a quote that I picked up from a conference I attended a couple of years ago. The quote is from the author Jordan Peterson, and he's an interesting author. Some people absolutely love his writing, and others are really appalled and dislike his writing. But I want to share this quote with you to remind you how remarkable the church is. The quote is from a book called 12 Rules for Living. And I'm not necessarily advocating you go out and get this book, but I love the quote that comes from it. Because the quote is about you, it's about me, and it's about the church and the influence of Jesus and Christianity. He writes, Christianity achieved the well-nigh impossible. Exactly. The Christian doctrine elevated the individual soul, placing slave and master, commoner and nobleman alike, on the same metaphysical footing, rendering them equal before God and the law, to which we would say, of course. But the author is about to remind us, no, not of course. This was unheard of. The implicit, transcendent worst of each and every soul established itself against impossible odds. The teaching of a single man, a single rabbi, with no one around protecting him, 
from the forces all around him in the temple and the empire of Rome, this one individual whose soul teaching should have never survived the first century brought about the impossible. Jordan continues, It is in fact nothing short of a miracle that the hierarchical slave-based societies of our ancestors reorganized themselves under the sway of an ethical religious revelation such that the ownership and absolute domination of another person came to be viewed as wrong. And in some parts of the world, it took longer than others to get this. And from our perspective, it took way, way too long. But Jordan Peterson's point is this. It was the ethical groundwork of the teaching of Jesus that made it possible at all. Peterson says, we forget we forget that the opposite was self-evident throughout most of human history. See, what is self-evident to us that slavery is wrong and that owning another person is wrong, mistreating another person is wrong, that that is self-evident. Meaning you don't even really need to explain to anyone that that is wrong. Peterson is saying it was equally as obvious and equally self-evident that the opposite was true before the teachings of Jesus took hold of culture. The society produced by Christianity was far less barbaric than the pagan, even the Roman ones it replaced. It objected to infanticide, which was a horrible thing that people did to unwanted babies. They would often take an unwanted baby and leave it outside or in the wilderness, and would leave it up to fate if the baby would survive, saying, if it's their fate to live, then they will be here when I come back. And it was Christians who objected to this, often taking these babies in and raising them. Eventually, infanticide was banned and declared illegal. But after the Christians were the first to object and to do something about it, it objected to infanticide to prostitution, and to the principle that might means right. It insisted that women were as valuable as men. It demanded, it demanded that even a society's enemies be regarded as human. All of this was asking the impossible. But it happened. Because once upon a time before Jesus, once upon a time before the church, once upon a time, for those who came before us, this was inconceivable. No one could even imagine the ethic of Jesus toppling a worldview that had been established for so long, that was practiced both inside and outside the empire, inside and outside the temple. Now, here's the thing. And please don't take this next word to mean anything political. And this is kind of the issue right now, isn't it? Normal words I have to be careful about saying because everything is so politically charged right now. So don't respond with anything except a preacher saying a couple of words. But most of us, our world, our lives, we want to be great. We want to be great dads, great moms. We want to be great kids and students. We want to have great friends and drive a great car. We want to have maybe a great girlfriend or a great boyfriend. We want to have a great house that has great air conditioning. We even want great Wi-Fi, right? We want our lives to be great. And we also want to be a great follower of Jesus, a great Christian. And here is something we can all agree on. We want all of those things and more to be great, but we want them to be the Jesus version of great. And maybe you remember this. In Mark chapter 10, when Jesus and his guys are on their way to Jerusalem, and Jesus hears them behind him arguing about who is going to be the greatest. You remember this story, right? Jesus turns around and stops them in their tracks. And he says, okay, you want to be great? And they say, yeah, we want to be great. 
Okay, it's good to want to be great. But let me define great for you. You know how the Romans do it. You know how the Gentiles do it. You know the ones with the power, they keep the power. They leverage the power to make sure they get everything they want. It's like the pyramid scheme. And they are at the top and they leverage all of their power and influence to make sure they get what they want and keep what they want. You know, that's how it works, right? And they're like, yeah. You see, that's why we want to be great. Because soon, Jesus, you're going to go to Jerusalem and you're going to move from being rabbi and switch to king. And we know we can't be number one because you're number one. But we want to be right up close to the top, maybe two, three, four, five, six, right there near the top. So that's why we're having this conversation about who will be great. And Jesus is like, good. So you know how it works. Not so with you. That's not how my kingdom works. That's not how this system is going to work. That's not how my movement is going to work. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to be great, and I'm, I'm glad you want to be great, must be your servant, which means that you go get in the back of the line. And whoever wants to be first must be slave of all, which meant something to them. And it means something more to us right now too, doesn't it? Which means that you go get in the back of the back of the line. Then Jesus makes this statement, which are kind of like our marching orders. He makes this statement that turned the world upside down. He makes a statement that we should all commit to memory. He says, guys, look at me. For even the Son of Man, talking about himself, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So if you're going to follow me, this is what it looks like. And in this moment, Jesus became the king who came to reverse the order of things. He would be the king who would lay down his life for his subjects before he asked his subjects to lay down their lives for him. And the cool thing is this. In the book of Acts, they got it. You know what the first problem with the new church is in the book of Acts? It's that we can't get Peter and Andrew and James and John to quit serving widows. They're like, look, guys, we know you got it. We know you are humble. We are humble. But look, you are the only ones who spent time with Jesus. And we need you to preach. Yeah, I know, but we don't want anyone to think we're too uppity or that we're too good. No, 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 we got it. We got it. You're serving. You're doing what Jesus commanded, okay? Nobody thinks that you are too uppity. No, they won't. Now, let us serve the widows so you can go and preach and teach. And then a culture that worshipped violence, celebrated violence, worshipped power, a culture that worshipped victory. The ruling class found this to be appalling. It was so against the nature of how things were. It was so against everything they thought how the world was supposed to operate. But for those who benefited from this upside-down kingdom, they found this to be very, very appealing. And eventually, it became contagious. And eventually, a Jewish sect with no leader, no land, no military, no earthly authority survived, multiplied, and eventually changed the world. Now, why am I telling you all this? Because this is your story. This is how it all got started. This is our history. And this is our way forward. This is why, this is why how you live is so important. 
This is why how you treat other people is so important. This is why growing your faith is so important. This is why the money that you give to church and other organizations is so important. Why every service we hold is important. It's why you serve the church is so important. Why every middle schooler and high schooler who is discipled or baptized is so important. How you care for people is so important. Why our children's ministry is so important. And this is how we become and show what Jesus said, that we are to be the salt of the earth. How we show that we are the light of the world. That we live our lives in such a way that others may see our good deeds and connect the dots to our Father in heaven. So you li- how you live is a big deal. This is a big deal. The church is a big deal. And here is what is truly amazing. Jesus said he was going to establish it, and he established it. And what do you know? It keeps going, and it keeps getting bigger and bigger. There's no denying that it happened. The only question is, how did it happen? And I always think, well, let's look at the people who were closest to it and let them explain how it happened. And why not look at Peter, who was there? Why not look to Paul, who was there in the beginning? They explain how it happened. And all the way back to that important moment in Caesarea Philippi, when Jesus said, I'm going to start something new. And it is never going to end. And it's going to grow and grow and grow. So this is not just for you disciples or these people who are around us hearing right now. This is for the world. This is what God was up to when he promised Abraham that he would bless the world through Abraham's offspring. And Jesus says, guys, this is it. And you get to be part of it. Peter, people in the 21st century will name their children after you. John, people are going to name their sons after you. James, People are going to name their sons after you. Andrew, people are going to name their sons after you. Judas, people are going to... Well, anyway, it's going to be a big deal. So, remember, the church changed the world once. And there is still a great big deal of our world that needs to change. And I hope that this summer series, with God's grace that you, that I, will be part of that change that needs to take place. So, for the rest of the summer, we're going to be hearing from different voices on how we do this. And if you remember, the new commandment that Jesus brings, to love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. So, How do we love one another? Fortunately for us, one of the men who was there in the beginning outlines all of this for us in his letters. The Apostle Paul took Jesus' command and separated it all out so we can live in a practical way and one another, the people around us. So I hope that you will join us these next couple of weeks as we kick off this summer series, One Another. For now, I would invite you to close with me in prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for the loving one another attitude and mentality and posture that you brought to us. Lord, that you led us through that entire sacrificial love that you brought to us. And Lord, let us remember that it was at our worst when you did the most and reached out and loved us. So Lord, we ask that your Holy Spirit would be with us and go before us so that we can follow through your word and one another, the people who are around us in all of these wonderful ways. We thank you for this time and it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.
have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus. regrets and mistakes. Come today, there's no reason to wait. Jesus is calling. Bring your sorrows and trade them for joy. From the ashes a new life is born. Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open. Blood of Jesus.